So here's the question. How does one discover and embody their life's purpose? This is what I want deeply to support you in, to find and live your soul's calling. So I invite you right now to enter a non-ordinary state, a kind of receptivity and learning space, taking a step into a world of imagination. The Sufis call it the imaginal realm. So I invite you to all of us join together and take seriously the possibility of having a deeper and more intimate relationship with your soul's calling. Take it deadly seriously if you want, or you can take it laughingly seriously. So I'm going to give you a five-part philosophical foundation as a jumping off point, as a launch pad for you to take what is an ever deepening experience of living a soul-infused life. No matter where you are, here, 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 you can deepen your experience of living a soul-infused life. So here are the five parts. Part one, there's a triple purpose of life to wake up to enlightenment, non-duality, spirit. To grow up into what I like to call an emotional adult. Easier said than done. And to show up with our life's purpose as a gift of service to the world. Part two is that purpose is best understood not as a psychological enterprise, but as an expression of our spiritual lives. Part three is that uh, purpose discovery work is actually best understood as a spiritual practice. That it's not so much about purpose for egos or a purpose for personalities. It's not about reading a book or making a purpose statement. It's a revelation that comes from deep inside of us or outside of us, if you will, and reveals itself to us and asks us, calls us, demands of us to offer it up to the world. Part four is that the moment we step uh, onto the purpose path, there are forces that will be pressing against us in the opposite direction. And part five is that there are eight facets of your soul's purpose, I call the purpose octagon. So, part one, three worlds, one life. So I play a, a multiple roles in my career right now. I'm a meditation teacher, a psychotherapist, and a purpose guide. And from that viewpoint, I notice that these three different wisdom streams have you know, very different aims. And I've noticed that the big missing piece in both meditation traditions, I come from the Zen and Advaita Vedanta tradition, um, and in psychotherapy is a, an ignoring to a small or large degree the importance and the primacy of purpose. So unlike psychotherapy, which tends to rest its attention on the question of healing and growing, and unlike meditation, which is this beautiful invitation to simply abide as unbounded, non-dual awareness or spirit. The purpose guide has their finger on a different question. And it's the question of what do I do? It's not the question of pure being, of transcendence. It's not the question of psychotherapy. How do I heal and become happier? It's the question of calling and destiny. What do I do? As the poet Mary uh, Oliver put it, what do I do with this one wild, precious life? What if we had to answer that to pass, you know, being a homo sapien by the end of the, the lifetime? So there are three distinct inquiries, one for each of these wisdom streams. So in psychotherapy, you might say that the inquiry is, how do I heal my wounds? 
and grow and become happier, metabolize more joy. And in meditation, the inquiry may be something like, who am I at the level of essence? It's not really a level, but we'll make that concession to the mind. Who am I or what am I as pure spirit, as pure awareness? But again, the purpose guide has a different inquiry, and it's what am I to become? What am I to do? As the um, theologian uh, Frederick Beekner put it, how do I find that place where my deepest gladness and the world's hunger meets? How do I find that place where my deepest joy and the world's ache and longing and pain meet? It's this beautiful paradox, your greatest joy and heartbreak and the world's heartbreak coming together. This is unsurpassed. So uh, each of these worlds um, constitutes uh, or each of these, these wisdom streams constitutes a whole world of human consciousness. In part, um, I owe so much to uh, the guide Bill Plotkin in his seminal uh, book, Soulcraft. So some of this three worlds model comes from him. Um, but I also draw on uh, Sufi, um, uh, the Sufi tradition, uh, Ibn Arabi and Sudrawardi and Ari Corban, I draw from James Hillman and Carl Jung, from shamanism and other indigenous wisdom traditions, from Jewish mysticism and Greek cosmology and philosophy and, and on and on. Let's see if I can get this to go. Yay. So this graph kind of shows you these three worlds and what I think of are as the, its signature desires, its paths, pathways its focus, and its ultimate fruition. So here's one thing I really want you to remember. Please remember this. A different world comes into view depending upon where we rest our attention. Attention is everything. And so in the so-called upper world, where do we rest our attention? The great mystery, spirit, God, I'll just say awareness for the moment. So what happens when we rest attention on awareness? Fire sirens come. <laughs> but that's actually what happens, right? <laughs> so the fire sirens come, and we actually have the opportunity, the experience of waking up out of the separate self-sense, the self-contraction, and into unbounded awareness. Now that's a concession to the mind because you don't really wake up out of a little thing called me into something else called unbounded awareness, but we'll, we'll leave it like that for today. So waking up in this context is really about a softening and a dissolving of what's sometimes called the skin encapsulated ego. What's that? It's just the sense of me. Jonathan in this case, Sally and Joe and Brandon and Mitzi and, and all of you. And we can actually have this experience of this dissolution of the self-sense and experience ourselves literally as the spirit or the mystery that animates and permeates everything yet transcends all. and it's perfectly safe. I have the privilege right now of studying with uh, what I regard to be as three genuine sages. And each one of them has an ego. This idea of ego death is not true in my experience. But here's the interesting twist. It's that the death is the death of the center of gravity of identity with ego dissolves and the ego and personality are left and they're actually enlightened by, they're illuminated by the fact that it's one brilliant facet on this giant diamond of wholeness that is you. So that's why I say it's safe. Now there's a whole nother world of human wholeness 
and you could call it the middle world of our everyday selves. And here we take an interesting journey, and again, it's claiming what may have been unclaimed previously, taking the facets or subpersonalities of our ego from the shadow and into the light, from unconsciousness into consciousness. We reclaim ourselves. And we have the ability, this is actually a possibility, to more or less walk through life as an integrated, full-functioning human being at the level of personality. You are all of you. For short, I just call this emotional adulthood, of which I think there are three hallmarks. So here's a segue, and I'll come back. An emotional adult, hallmark number one, is the ability to give and receive love without any unnecessary impediment. We want more than anything to receive love, but there's a part of us that sometimes goes, oh, I don't know, I've got some conditions on that. And then there's a part of us that wants more than anything to give love. But, oh, I don't know, is it safe? Can I do it? We've all experienced this. Second hallmark, the ability to have a high degree of joy tolerance. It's a take on um, uh, pain tolerance. I, uh, in my YouTube browsing time off, I like watching, um, amongst other things, uh, videos of the Navy SEALs doing their thing. And these Navy SEALs have to have a very high degree of pain tolerance or they wash out, you know, in the first day. And I, I am, like, characterologically, you know, not disposed to be a Navy SEAL. I don't like the water. I don't like the cold. I don't want to be shot at. And I don't take orders very well. But a, a, a high degree of joy tolerance is actually a muscle, a capacity we can grow. How much joy can you stand? How much of it is coming at you like, like sunlight? And how much of you are like solar cells, willing, ready, and able to take it in and then give it right back? You turn it, you take it in, and it's joy energy that comes right back at your people. All right, the third hallmark of emotional adulthood is the ability to rest as equanimity and not sell our peace out too cheaply. We can't find a parking space, we sell it out. We we're stuck in traffic, we sell it out. The other day, my computer went completely on the fritz. I definitely sold out my peace. <laughs> That's okay, but then how quickly does it take to come back? We can shorten that gap. All right, so that's the three hallmarks of what I call the middle world purpose of life, right? The whole realm of human wholeness is this middle world and giving and receiving love without any unnecessary impediment, a high degree of being able to metabolize joy, and the ability to rest as equanimity, not selling our peace out too cheaply. So the lower world, the third dimension of human wholeness. So you'll notice, right, coming back to sort of the main theme here, that it's all about wholeness, at least to me, right? In the upper world, it's about realizing there's no separation between ego and pure awareness, that it's one whole. In the middle world, it's the ability to recognize all the unowned, unhealed dimensions and bring them into an integrated, full-functioning way of meeting life. And then there's this third element of wholeness. And instead of uh, the journey kind of up and out to heaven, let's say, Right? The transcendent dimension is associated with spirit, non-duality, God, the great mystery, pure being, the middle world, everyday me. But the lower world, I choose the word soul. Actually, it's been chosen for me. I inherited it from many masters. And it's this experience of like burrowing down into your depths and discovering what is your gift for whom is this gift meant, and then to give it away. Well, this all hinges on the word soul. And I've been studying it for, I don't know, 30 years, and I still don't know what it is. 
but I, I've caught the scent, the perfume of it, and I want to uh, have us all smell its fragrance together. So uh, I invite you to close your eyes, because I just threw a, a lot at you uh, in a short time. Maybe we'll just take two deep breaths together as a group, joined together, breathing in. Hold it at the top and a big sigh, let it out. Breathing in. Hold it and release it. What is soul? What is soul? Soul is the great whisperer the Maha Whisperer, the unsurpassed Whisperer. What does soul whisper? It whispers your true name. Soul reminds you of your timeless commitment and deepest vow. Soul whispers in images and symbols. Soul whispers in felt sense, in bodily sensations that cannot be ignored. Soul whispers your destiny, your calling, your mythopoetic narrative. Soul is the body of your gift that fills up the garment of your life. Soul is the part of you that speaks through the imaginal realm. Soul is the source of your dream, your fantasy, your imagination for an evolved world. Soul is the myth maker and the narrative spinner. As the Sufis say, soul is an organ of perception, not the mind, Sometimes the body, but there's this organ that's often asleep, partially asleep. It's all sensitivity. It's all perceptivity. This way of receiving images, not fantasies. Soul is imagination. C.G. Jung uh, created a, a composite word of his own, Seelenbild. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but it means soul image, one word, soul image. What is the image at the center of your being, at the core of you? Little fragment from David White. Soul is also place, your niche or niche in the ecology of life. You have a place. This is from Bill Plotkin's Soulcraft. Your soul is your true nature. Your soul can also be thought of as your true place in nature. At the soul level, you have a specific way of belonging to the biosphere as unique as any maple or moose or mountain. It is your calling, and I would say your obligation to flower, to bear fruits as the unique tree that you are. If you do not flower, the world cannot fully flower. I don't know if I should say intended, but I'll go for it. What has it been, 13.72 billion years or so? all the way to only say, oh, I don't know, I don't, I, yeah, I think I'll just stay like small. 
everything else can flower. We can refuse our own flowering. My cats don't seem to have the ability to refuse their own flowering. One's the bedhead, the other my wife calls the string slut because she just loves chasing the string. And they are themselves. And a rose doesn't want to be a, you know, a tulip, and a tulip doesn't want to be, you know, something else other than that it is. So how do we approach soul? Soul work is a descent. That's how I experience it. A descent into our interior, but the interior turns out to be also exterior. Jung said, most of soul resides outside of the body. I would say soul resides inside the body, is the body, and is outside the body. Soul work is initiated by your longing, your ache. This is the second thing I really want you to remember, <laughs> other than where you rest attention is everything. The second thing is soul work is initiated and is empowered by your longing. And it has to have a purpose beyond self. If it's just for me, like, ooh, it would be so exciting to know my purpose, which it is, but it's a lot of work. And it's not an easy life, it's a fulfilling life, but it's not a relaxing life. It's, that's not my experience. So this longing is to listen to it, to blow on the embers of this desire, this holy soul-level desire. Soul work is the willingness to let your life speak. Not your ego, not your mind, not something you uh, read in a book, but to receive from the imaginal realm of you what you're called to do. And it's not a choice. I know we love choice, but it isn't a choice. It's a discovery. It's an awakening, right? Purpose for egos would be like, oh, I want, I want to have some say. But you don't have a say. It's like discovering your sexual identity. I didn't sit down one day and think, well, what are my options? I've got uh, homosexuality, bisexuality, and I could be straight. Hmm, which one? If it was like that, I'd pick bisexuality. Why leave anybody out? <laughs> but it was discovered that I'm like, ooh, women. OK, yeah, that, that's, that's for me. Right? There was no choice. And it's the same thing at the level of soul. What is true, you discover it. Now you can co-create the expression of it. That's where the originality and the motivation and the joy happens. Endless iterations of your purpose. Very fun. But the core of it is you receive it. It's a spiritual revelation from soul. So um, what is the deepest conversation you can have with life? I think that's David Abram. And so uh, what I do with, uh, with the people that I work with is um, a few things. One is I create these guided meditations. And the guided meditations always have two parts. The first is the softening and dissolving of the self-contraction. You will never, never, never be able to find purpose with your ego any more than as an old-time Zen student my ego can successfully do zazen. Just, I've tried. <laughs> tried to do a koan with uh, my mind, and splat, doesn't work. It just, it just doesn't work. Same thing with soul discovery. So always relaxing the boundaries of the egoic self. And then the next thing is entering this alternate way of knowing through the imaginal. Some of the ways I do it is this animal guide meditation, the 10 years process, the soul cave meditation, and on and on and on. And you begin to listen from the whole of you, from your body, kinesthetically, imagistically, symbolically. I always bring people out into wild nature for a, a distilled version of a vision quest ceremony I call the soul quest. A minimum of eight hours 
asking the question and then allowing your ears to be as big as the space around you, the whole planet, in fact. You're listening through and as the trees and caterpillars and winds and sky and earth. That might seem odd or difficult, but with a little support, it's, it's absolutely doable. So, the moment we step onto the purpose discovery path, we meet challenges. We meet forces that work against us. I coined a term, default purpose, because I'm one of those people who conceptually believes that every human being is already living on purpose. We are deeply narrative creatures. I mean, it's one of the hallmarks of Homo sapien. So if we are not connected with our deepest driving desire, by default, we'll slip into something else. And it's often, you know, fame, success, money, and that kind of thing. And it's not that everything about our default purpose is unwholesome. That's just simply not the case, right? If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I want safety, I want security, I want to feel like I belong. I want self-esteem. I want you to esteem me. It's the, all of this is there. But here's the thing. Is that my deepest driving desire? Because if it is, then I've whoosh, switched into default purpose. And we can never have enough of what we don't really need. Because if you don't know your soul's purpose and you get into the safety mode, you'll build a really big bunker. I mean, if you have the money or, you know, want more and more fame, it's addictive. Or, you know, fame, all that stuff. All right. Um, we live in a soul illiterate culture. When I was young, my parents said to me, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And what they meant was, um, how do you uh, want to earn a living? which is a decent enough question, because it turns out they were right, I have to earn a living. Um, but it, that's not the deepest possible question. So uh, I have an eight-year-old, and uh, I, said, I say to him, here he is, uh, making short work of a cupcake when he was two years old. The cupcake lost. He literally drilled that he had never had sugar, and he drilled down into it without breathing for like three minutes. There's a video of it. It's amazing. His purpose was, I want to devote my life to sugar. So I get it. And I told him, did you know ye inside of you, secreted with inside of you, is a soul level purpose? And when you find it, you, it will be a thrilling thing to live it, and people will benefit from what you have to offer. And he just nods and goes, yeah, great. And then I said to him, you know, do you have any idea what it is? And he said, uh, no. And I said, that's okay, you're eight years old. Uh, and, but then I pivoted to, you know, the question that uh, my parents asked me. And I said, well, all right, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, uh, I want to be a ninja. Uh, which is going to be difficult for a, a Korean-American to get a job as an ancient Japanese assassin. But you never know. All right, and then the third force working against us is uh, competing commitments. We have multiple commitments in our lives, right? Safety, security, belonging, success. When I wake up every morning, I feel two different voices. One of them I've nicknamed the bedhead. And the bedhead sounds like this. I love this mattress, it's thick. I love these flannel sheets, they're soft. I love this bed, it's warm, let's stay here. <laughs> then there's another voice that goes, oh my God, I woke up again, I'm 50, this is good news. Let's jump into life while you have the chance. Right? And so these are going in different directions. So we have a lot of different commitments, and part of purpose-guiding work is to actually take that into consideration. To take that in consideration and work skillfully with our competing commitments. All right, so last part here. When we find 
our soul's purpose is not some monolithic thing. So imagine the white light of your soul's purpose hitting a prism, and you have all these different wavelengths or frequencies of your purpose. First one, what is the vision of your purpose? If I were to live and embody my soul's purpose fully and successfully, and you were all to do the same, and then we flash forward a hundred or a thousand years, what would happen? Love is the key here. I'll die in, you know, a day, a week, a year, a couple decades from now, but there's an immortality when you live your soul's purpose because that love continues. And I imagine a great big uh, uh, UFO hovering over Earth in a thousand years and one alien saying to the other, I'm so glad we came to this corner of the Milky Way. Look at these like, you know, uh, hairless apes. They are prodigious fountains and wellsprings of goodness, truth, and beauty. Let's say hello. Versus if there's a UFO, you know, hovering right now, I imagine they might say, look at these hairless monkeys. At the very least, they seem a little confused and a little dangerous. Let's come back, you know, in a, in a little while. What are our soul's core values? The deepest values that animate our work in life. What are our soul's core powers? The gifts or innate genius or strengths or talents that we have been given not to support the ego's vision of our lives, but to support our soul's vision. It's possible to know and awaken your soul's core powers to a great extent without knowing what your vision is. For example, Adolf Hitler, very powerful guy, really connected to his soul's core powers, uh, an amazing orator, a uh, huge leader, uh, organiz organization, really, you know, amazing in all these things. But what were his soul, soul core powers in service to? A twisted, pathological, egoic vision. Imagine if, they ha if he had a purpose guide. <laughs> all right. Um, so what is it that we do? I call it the giveaway. This is from uh, a Native American tradition. What is truly yours, truly yours at a soul level to give away to your people? And I want to make, there's the third thing I want you to remember. <laughs> the distinction between a delivery vehicle and your giveaway. If you order a pizza, the nourishment is the pizza pie in the box. The delivery vehicle is a bicycle or a, uh, a truck or a car. They're very different. In my case, my delivery vehicles are to be an integral mentor, to be a psychotherapist, a meditation teacher, and a purpose guide. These are not, not, not my purpose. My purpose is this imagistic thing that I received when I was 21, and it just said two words. It was really an image, but I put it into words. Whole person midwifery. <laughs> and that, the moment I heard it, saw it, I felt it. I was on this meditation retreat alone for three weeks in a cabin in the middle of the woods, and then I was just contemplating my life between meditations. I was pretty quiet, and boom, I had the imaginal realm, there it was. And I realized I, I'm going to be in service to this for the rest of my life. To, for the rest of my life. So there's a difference between your giveaway and your delivery vehicle. And the giveaway isn't just, I'm a whole person midwife. What does a whole person midwife do? I don't have time to tell you, but it has step one, two, three, four, five, six. It has a whole process, a whole span. And so we have our message at a soul level. Mine is wake up, grow up, show up. And what is our task? What is the next task? I have a queue of tasks that I will not be able to finish in this lifetime. One of them right now is to create the Harvard of Purpose, Purpose Guiding Institutes. And I can't do it alone, and I may not finish it in this lifetime. But that task is not my purpose. It's an expression of needing to be, of being called, of being obligated, being compelled to be a midwife to wholeness. A 
All right, well, I need to bring it in for landing. So point one, there's a triple purpose of life. Wake up to enlightenment, grow up into an emotional adult, integrated human being, metabolizing vast amounts of joy. See that purpose discovery is actually not a psychological exercise for the mind, but a spiritual revelation. And number three, that purpose work is spiritual practice. You don't have to be religious, I'm not religious but it has that spiritual perfume. Number four, there are forces that will inevitably be working against you, interpsychically, interpersonally, and in the world. And fifth, that your purpose has eight distinct facets. I like this image because it's this, this idea of incarnating and coming through the prism, and our distinct octagon, these wavelengths, are a gift a timeless gift of your love for all generations and all creatures. So here's the final thing I want to say. Please take seriously taking the next step wherever your edge is. We all have our edge. I have mine, and then I'm scared to go this next one. And there's the, you know, the daily, uh, what is it in my case? Uh, let's see, a drink of scotch and some chocolate and some YouTube. <laughs> and I just made a, a, a promise to the, the purpose guides, I'm working with 35 folks who are going to become purpose guides now, and I said, I'm giving up the scotch. And I'll just spend some time on the couch just seeing, am I avoiding anything? And sometimes I'm not, and sometimes I am. For me, it's health issues. I don't like to feel my body because it's so tired. So I, someone said today, you know, it's about subtraction. It's not so much about addition, although it's addition in terms of awakening to that which is already here your soul's purpose. And the subtraction is, what do I not need to bring into the cocoon of transformation? How much scotch, how much YouTube, how much chocolate do I need? Part of me goes, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean to pathologize any of those things. If you can do them in moderation, comfort and taking a break and going dark is totally wholesome. But we know who we are, you know, when we, when we overdo it. So, Please find and embody your purpose and find that place where your deepest joy and your deepest gladness and the world's hunger and ache meets. The world's counting on us. Thank you. <laughs>